Now, will you notice, we come to chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come, thou and all thy house, into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Why was he righteous? By faith. Just like Abraham later on was. We're told Abraham believed God and is counted to him for righteousness. Noah believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And by faith, the writer to the Hebrews said, that's the reason God saved him. But have you ever noticed how gracious God is to this man in all of this time of judgment? It says, Come thou. The same invitation that the Lord Jesus gives today to all mankind. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. And then we're told in verse 16 here, the Lord shut him in. Isn't that lovely? And then chapter 8 opens, and God remembered Noah. <laughs> how lovely. How wonderful. God could have very easily forgotten all about Noah. He could have years later said, oh my, I forgot all about that fellow down there. I put him in an ark and forgot about him. Been too bad, wouldn't it? But God didn't forget. God remembered Noah. God never forgets. He remembers you. <laughs> Only thing that he doesn't remember is your sin if you come to And his sins, he remembers them no more. What a beautiful thing this is. Now, Noah and the family enter into the ark. And did you know that this story of Noah, just like the story of creation, has wandered over the face of the earth? And you read it like you read the creation story I wish that I could give you the Babylonian account. I'm not entering into that. I did of the creation account. But all you have to do is compare them to see the difference that these others are utterly preposterous and ridiculous. And they're all based on this one, by the way. And the very fact that most nations, most peoples have an account of both creation and the flood, doesn't that tell you something, friend? That ought to tell you that there's a basis of truth for that. All of them wouldn't come up with a record if they had been making up the story. And if you want to know which one is accurate, just make a comparison. The Babylonian, of course, here is perfectly ridiculous. And you have sort of a war going on among the gods, one against the other, and that's what brought the flood. That's not the way that the Bible tells it. It's a judgment upon man for his sin. Makes sense, by the way. Now we're told here, and for yet seven days, God says, I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Now will you notice the fact that there came to Noah, and I should call attention to this, I was about to bypass it. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. Now, this was the basis of a lawsuit years ago against Dr. Harry Rimmer when he offered $1,000 to anyone that could show a, a contradiction in the Bible. And this was what was used in a court of law. And there were several liberal theologians that testified this was a contradiction. Why would it say two of each kind and now seven of each kind? Well, all you have to do is turn over to see Noah get out of the ark, and he was offering clean beasts as sacrifices. Where would he have got the clean beast, friends, if he hadn't taken more than the two? It's only the clean beasts that he took seven, and now we know why. And those that are not clean were by two, the male and the female. And the fowls of the air by sevens, the male and the female. And that is for those that are clean, to keep seed alive, upon the face of all the earth. Now, for seven days, the world could have knocked at the door of the ark, and frankly, they could have come in. God would have saved them. All you'd have to do is believe God. Now, we're told, verse 6, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Noah went in, his sons, his wives, his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. That's verse 7 that I've just read. Then we're told here, verse 9, There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. No place does it say Noah went out and drove them in. 
and it wasn't necessary. They came to him. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. That's verse 11. The rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And now I drop down and read verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now, we're told that the flood was forty days upon the earth. Now, the waters, though, prevailed, and I'm dropping down to the last verse, verse 24, chapter 7, and the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. Now, that's how long that the flood lasted. Then we're going to find out that it subsided another period of time, and we'll talk about that next time. Now, may I, in the few moments that are left of me, may I say this? What is the scientific historical evidence of the flood? I'm not going to enter into this subject other than to say that there is one of the finest books, and I highly recommend it, called The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris and John C. Whitcomb. Both of these men are thoroughly qualified to write on this subject. Dr. John Whitcomb is a Ph.D., and he's professor of Old Testament and Grace Theological Seminary. And Dr. Morris is a Ph.D. from the University of Minnesota, and he is professor of hydraulic engineering, chairman of the Department of Civil Engineering in the Virginia Polytechnic Institute. And these men have joined together and have written a book on the Genesis Flood. And they show that this flood was universal. And also that it was a great catastrophe, that there's historical evidence for it. And they answer this uniformitarian argument that has been put forth today. And I'll not go into these different theories that have been advanced. And have quite a few been advanced for the flood. But may I say there's abundance of evidence for the flood. And they answer a great deal of this. Now, next time, I'm going to pick up right at this juncture and probably give from their book one or two arguments, and then I'm going to move on from this. I assume that today that there is this historical evidence for the flood, and it's not necessary for us to go into that. And it's been answered in this very graphic and scholarly manner. Today, friends, our study brings us to the eighth chapter of the book of Genesis. And if you have your Bible and will turn there, I hope you're reading along with us, and maybe you've read the eighth chapter. Now, we have seen last time the flood. And we were talking about the flood and saying that there were many details we were not going into. And I was quoting from a book that I highly recommend the title of it is The Genesis Flood, and it's by Henry M. Morris and John C. Whitcomb, Jr. And both of these men are competent to write on such a subject, and they answer many questions for you today. There has come from the press recently several books from men I consider pseudo-intellectuals and pseudo-theologians, for that matter. I know several of them. And they take the position that the flood was local. That is, it was confined to the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. In other words, they had sort of a big swimming pool there. And that's about all that it was. May I say to you, this book absolutely demolishes that thought altogether. And I'm sure that most of you realize the Scripture made it very clear that the flood covered the whole earth. God said that the entire earth was to be destroyed by the flood. And he said that he would destroy. The earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then if you say that the flood was not universal, the human family had already got to North America, and the animals were certainly here. Nobody would argue that point for a moment. Well, the fact of the matter is, then you have somebody except Noah starting the human family all over again. And that's just not the way the Word of God tells it, friends. You either accept the Bible 
or you don't make excuses for it. You either are on the horns of a dilemma, as I see it. You either have to accept it, what it says, or you have to reject what it says. And to my judgment, to attempt to make a case like that is actually in the long run to reject the Word of God. I think it makes it very clear that it was. It says, "...every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark." That is 7.23, Genesis 7.23. And it says in verse 24, that's where we left off last time, "...and the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days." In other words, for a period of approximately half a year, if you please, for five months the waters prevailed on the earth. And that is the story. Now, in chapter 8, we have the assuaging of the flood. Somebody said, what do you mean by the assuaging? Well, let's read verse 1 of chapter 8. And God remembered Noah. Isn't that a lovely thing? And every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. Now, this book I've referred you to, I think, answers the question about whether it was a local flood, it was universal, and also answers this question of uniformitarianism. There are those that take that position, you know, that there was no such thing as a great convulsion or catastrophe like the flood. Well, that viewpoint is helped by a great many, and I'm not going into detail. This book gives a great deal of detail. And Peter, in his second epistle, makes that very clear that we could expect there'd be those today that would come in the last days, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. Now, this is Second Peter 3.3. 3. Now I'm reading the fourth verse. And what are they doing and saying? Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, you see, the scoffer has always been a uniformitarian. And this book makes it very clear that you couldn't very well hold that position and accept the integrity of the Word of God at this particular point. That's very important to see. Now, we not only have here the building up of the flood, but also the prevailing and the assuaging of the flood. And we're told that God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuage. Now, it didn't happen just overnight. The build up of the waters over 150 days. And then actually, there are 261 days in the assuaging. And that looks to me like it's something more than just a local flood. And I'm not going to go through this. This is an exercise in mathematics. But you find here that verse 2 and 3, and let me read them. Fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. And then we're told, verse 6, "...and it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made." Now you have this beginning of the end, let's say, of the flood. Now notice what he did. He sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. Frankly, Noah became a bird watcher. He's sending out the two birds, the raven and the dove. Now, the thing that happened was this, but the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her unto him into the ark. 
and he stayed yet other seven days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth. And that, may I say, brings you to 200, as we have indicated, 261 days. So that the total time of the flood was 371 days, and that extended over a year. Now that, may I say, also conforms to the statement of Scripture that the flood was universal, that it was not just filling of a swimming pool. It certainly was more than that. May I say that there are other things that have revealed something concerning the flood. Now, I'd like to pass that on to you, and I'm quoting now from another, from Dr. J.E. Shelley, and he takes the position that the flood was universal, covered the entire earth. And I'm quoting from him now, and he says, "...the most striking example of this is found in the case of the mammoths. These elephants are found buried in the frozen silt of the tundra Siberia, all over the length of the continent of Asia and in the north of Alaska and Canada. They are found in herds on the higher ground, not bogged in marshes, hundreds of thousands in number. Now he goes on to talk about them, that they've been examined, that they were drowned, and if they just got bogged up, they'd have died of starvation. And the farther north one goes, the more they are. Tell the soil of the islands of the White Sea inside the Arctic Circle consists largely of their bones mingled with those of saber-toothed tiger, giant elk, cave bear, musk ox, and with trunks of trees and trees rooted in the soil. Now, there are now no trees in those regions the nearest being hundreds, almost thousands of miles away. The mammoth could not eat the stunted vegetation which now grows in this region, but for three months in the year, a hundred square miles of which would not keep one of them alive for a month. The food in their stomachs is pine, hawthorn branches. These mammoths were buried alive in the silt when the silt was soft. They and the silt were then suddenly frozen and have never been unfrozen, for they show no sign of decomposition. And then he goes on to tell about mammoth ivory has been sold on the London docks for more than a thousand years. The Natural History Museum purchased a mammoth's head and tusk from the ivory store of the London docks. This head was absolutely fresh and was covered with its original fur. Explorers have saved their lives by eating the flesh of these animals, which have been in cold storage for about 4,600 years. May I say to you, friends, if you want evidence of the flood and that it's universal, there is an abundance of evidence if you're willing to accept it. Now, may I leave that and see a great spiritual truth that we have here in this eighth chapter when we read to you about the dove and about the raven, the old crow that was put out, you see. Now, we find here that when he sent the flood and Noah spent all that time, he was over a year in there, why now he sends forth a raven and the raven never came back, but the dove kept coming back and even brought in its beak a little bit of greenery, an olive leaf. And I don't know why that's always been the picture of peace, but it is. And I can't quite see that that is exactly the message at the first visit. But when he didn't return at all, when you have no dove, that's the sign the judgment is over. And there is peace that's returned to the earth. But, of course, man going out again is the same type of man that all the sons of Adam were that 
provoked the flood in the first place as a judgment from God. And you're going to see not too much improvement in man after the flood. In fact, none whatsoever. Now, there's a great spiritual lesson here, and I wouldn't have you miss that for anything in the world. We find Noah here now engaged in what we'd call bird watching, and he sends out the raven. The raven didn't come back. Why didn't that raven come back? Well, that raven, you have to recognize what it eats. And that raven eats just about anything. In fact, the matter is, there was a whole lot of flesh floating around after the flood. You can think of the dead animals and all of that floating around. And that's what this old crow ate, was that kind of a thing. And he didn't return because, after all, he was really going to a feast. And he was having a very wonderful time. He's an unclean bird, by the way. Now, the dove is a clean bird, and so listed later on. And remember that he took into the ark both clean and unclean. Now, the dove brought back information. It was a regular homing pigeon. And on its second trip, he's now a confirmed bird watcher, as far as Noah's concerned because he's brought back evidence that the dry land's appearing. And then he did not return, and the waters of judgment are gone. Now, again, may I repeat something we've said before. All great truths of the Bible are germane in Genesis. The Bible teaches that the believer has two natures, old and a new nature. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And the clean and the unclean are together. You and I I have these two natures. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Our Lord said that. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And Paul says that I know that within my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But he says to will is present with me, but how to perform it I find not. And there was a struggle between the two natures, by the way. And there's a struggle today between the old nature and the new nature of a believer. And the raven went out into a judged world, but he found a feast and a dead carcass, because that's the thing he lived on. The bloated carcass of a dinosaur would have made him a banquet. I tell you, it would have been for him a bacchanalian orgy. And back and forth, he is restless. They went up and down. May I say to you, that's the picture of the old nature. The old nature is like that raven. The old nature loves the things of the world, (laughs) feasts on them. That's the reason so many people look at TV Sunday night and don't go to church. Oh, don't tell me that you've got some good excuse for that. You've got an old nature, but that's no excuse because you ought not to be living in the old nature. Now, the dove went out into a judged world, but he found no rest, no satisfaction. He returned to the ark. You see, today it's a matter of viewpoint. One of these professors said to me, this matter of what's right and wrong is relative. (laughs) He's right, it is. It's what God says is right, and what he says is wrong, and he doesn't find very much that's wrong. The old raven went out in the world and loved it. And the believers told today, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. You and I are living in a judged world today. We're in the world, not of it. We are to use it, but not to abuse it. We're not to fall in love with it. But we are today to attempt to win the lost in this world and get out the Word of God. This is the place to get it out today. He told us to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Let's take care of our job down here right now and get the word out down here. That's the important thing. But the dove recognized he's in that kind of a world, and he found no rest, only in the ark. And that ark sets forth Christ, if you please. Now, let me just ask you this very personal question, and you have to answer it for yourself. By the way, what kind of bird are you? Are you a raven or a dove? Well, you've got both natures, but which one you're living in today? You love the things of God or don't you? 
Well, now let me drop down here. I'm going to finish this chapter today. Verse 18, And Noah went forth, his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. Now God makes a covenant with Noah here, and we're going to see the new beginning next time when we get in that next chapter. fact of the matter is, we're going to see that God made a covenant with him. He can now eat meat and a covenant that has to do with capital punishment. It's a very important one. When God made it with Noah, he made it with the human family that's on the earth today. Now we're told, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now do you see why he took seven of the clean beasts, and only two of the unclean? He's offering the clean beasts now. Verse 21, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And you can just write that down, that that is true. What about your youth? Was your imagination evil or not? And we're beginning to see in our contemporary society, we've had the rebellion of youth today, and isn't it interesting the direction they've gone? They've gone to the direction of where every imagination of man's heart's evil from his youth, and it doesn't improve. In the hospital the other night, I was visiting a party there, and then the person in the next bed, the curtain was pulled, but you could hear them talking. Her husband came in, and you know it was a contest between those two to see who could outcuss the other one. I've never heard such profanity on the part of two human beings. May I say to you, the imaginations of man's heart's evil from his youth. That just happens to be an accurate statement. It was made a long time ago also. Now, he goes on. God says, "...neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease." Now, it has been suggested here that the flood was to the extent that it tilted the earth. As you know, the earth is not on its axis, actually not. We're off center, if you please, and the magnetic center is different from the center we're revolving on. Something happened somewhere along the line. It's the belief of many this is where it took place. And that's what makes what the Word of God says is the harvest and the cold and the seed time, the heat of summer and the cold of winter. That gives us our seasons. So the earth revolves like that. It's sort of going around like a wobbly top. Well, you remember when you were young and would spin a top. When it would run down, it would get wobbly. Well, that's the way the earth revolves today, actually. And as a result, we have the seasons. We come now to chapter 9, and here you have the covenant, which began here in verse 20 of chapter 8, extends on down, and you're going to find out God makes a certain covenant with Noah and gives to him some tremendous things. Never again will God destroy the earth with a flood is one thing. Man now can eat flesh. That seems to be something new we'll see next time. And then you have also God institutes capital punishment. Best I can tell, God's never changed that. Now, we'll get to all of that next time. Now, today, friends, we come to the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis. And we have come through the flood, I trust, and that we came through dry shod. But we have attempted to lift out of this tremendous incident some great spiritual truths that we believe are for us. Now, we have found out that when Noah came out of the ark, the first thing that he did was to build an altar to the Lord and offer a sacrifice to him, which was a burnt offering, as we're told here, and that 
burnt offering speaks of the person of Christ. It was offered on the basis of acceptance before God and a praise to God and a recognition of it. May I say to you that this was, without doubt, one of the things that caused God to be pleased with Noah at this particular time. Because we've seen in the flood, actually, man there learned the three R's. First was rebellion of God realized. It came right out in the open. And then there was the revelation from God, which was rejected. Noah's witness did not reach them. And then their repentance was absolutely repudiated. No return to God at all. And they refused the refuge that God had provided. And for 120 years, Noah had no converts. And so we have rebellion, revelation, and repentance. Those were the three R's, and they led in that first. But the other two, they rejected the revelation, and there was no repentance on their part. Now, this man Noah comes forth from the ark. And actually, friends, he stands in a most unique position. He stands in the position of being the head of the human race again, just in the same position Adam is. A great many people say, well, we're all related to Adam. May I say to you, we're closer kin than that. All of us are related to Noah. Noah is the father in one sense of all of us today. Now we have here in chapter 9 the new beginning. And you can imagine what a revolutionary beginning it is. The dispensation of human conscience is over with. Now, God is putting man down now under government. He's to govern himself. And that is something we'll see now in this covenant that God made with Noah. And when he made it with Noah, he made it with you and me, for he made it with all mankind. And we all have a stake in it. Now, he said to Noah, first of all, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And again... The word replenish is meaningful here because we know there was a civilization before the flood. Now, there is to be a civilization after the flood. But Adam was told to replenish the earth also. So, obviously, there must have been here on the earth before Adam creatures. I don't know what to call them, but creatures on this earth, living creatures, God's creation. And anything I say beyond that is speculation, to be sure. Now, will you notice he says, "...be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth." That's number one that God tells him to do. This is the propagation of the race. Now, there comes a time when God does not give that. I think we're living in that period right now because of the fact that we see in our day that there's overpopulation. We have a regular population explosion in our day that actually is quite dangerous. But again, let me come back to Noah and say he's in a unique position. He's the only one around. Just imagine one day driving out on the freeway, going to work of a morning, and there are cars in the front of you, Cars to the right of you, cars to the left of you, and cars behind you honking. And you're just in a traffic snarl. And then it's not but about a year later, you drive out on the freeway, and there's nobody there. You are the only one on the freeway. And you just, well, take down all the street lights because you won't need them because you're the only one driving through. May I say that would be quite uh, an unusual experience, would it not? Well, Noah had an experience like that for his day. Now, notice the second thing God says to him. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Now, we have man's protection and rulership of animals given. That's part of the covenant. 
And I take it before this that there were several things. Man, as we're going to see, did not eat meat before, and now he's able to eat meat. But before, he couldn't because all animals were tame. And you just don't like to eat tame animals, that is, those that you become attached to. And so we find that the animals came to Noah. There was no problem there at all. And man, therefore, today is responsible for the animal world. And man's treatment of the animal world is a brutal story. The way that they've attempted to exterminate, well, you take the whale out around the Hawaiian Islands. They had to stop why man was going to slaughter all of them, of course, for money. The buffalo been largely killed out in the West, and one time they went in great herds. Why? Well, man, and they have game refuges today in order to protect animal and bird life. And they do well to do that. The animals of Africa would all be exterminated. Man's a pretty brutal creature himself. And then the third thing, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now, before God gave to man the green herb, plant life to eat. Now he tells him that he'll be able to eat animal life. And this is something that you need to take in consideration. I've told the story many times about this woman who was a faddist on diet and was in a religion, of course, and that generally becomes a religion. And she made a great deal of the fact when I told her one day that the Antediluvians were all vegetarians. And that's what she was advocating and propagating was that we should just eat vegetables. She had one of her assistants to take it down, but I think it was a race later. I told her, I said, I wouldn't make too much of it because you must remember it was a bunch of vegetarians that were destroyed in the flood. And if diet had anything to do with it, then certainly they would not have been destroyed. But now man is permitted to eat flesh. Now, verse 4, "...but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat." In other words, the blood should be drained out. That speaks of life, and that would indicate that the animal was dead. Indicates something else, that the animal might be killed in a merciful way rather than prolonging its suffering. That is one of the reasons that I hate to hunt. And I ought not to put it like that. I love to hunt. And I haven't been able to now for a couple of years. I've been so busy at the fall season and was this year. But the fact of the matter is that the reason you don't like to shoot certain birds, quail, for instance, is that sometimes you merely wound the little fella and he just crawls away and you can't find him. Now, you don't like to do that. God says, when you are going to eat animals, why, the thing to do is to make sure you don't eat them with the blood. The blood should be drained out. In other words, the animals should be killed in a merciful manner. And he says, Surely your blood and your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Now, that's an interesting statement and not meaningful for us today because we do not live on a frontier and most of the frontiers are gone today. But up to the present hour, animals have been a danger to man. They still are a danger to man. There are certain animals that you do well to beware of. fact of the matter is, if there's a possum in your neighborhood or a skunk, you'll do well to beware of it. Chances are it has rabies. And animals are those that man is to beware of. Now, we have the next statement that God gives, and this is the amazing one, the fifth and the last one. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Now you have here you see something that's quite interesting, the principle for government and protection for man. And he gives to government 
capital punishment. So that we have, first, the propagation of the rights, protection and rulership of the animals, provision for food, and prohibition, that is, no blood is to be eaten. Now the principle of government, and this is the basis of capital punishment. And may I say to you that it's amazing the attitude that this generation, as it's gotten away from the Bible. You see, we do not have a Bible-oriented population today. They're totally ignorant of the Word of God, and that's one reason we're teaching the Bible, because we believe it's very important to teach the Word of God and that it's needed today. And as a result, you find the judges and the lawyers and our politicians all wanting to get rid of capital punishment. And they've done a pretty good job, and I think finally it'll be totally eliminated. And at the same time, we have the most horrible crimes that are taking place, and there is an increase in crime. As many of us predicted, I have a little book. The title of it is, Is Capital Punishment Christian? You'd have to specify that in particular because we're actually not offering it. But I've dealt with this very important subject. I believe today that capital punishment is scriptural. I think it's the basis of government, that a government has the right to take a life when that individual, in turn, has taken a life. Now, why? Well, it's quite obvious, I think. It's in order that God might protect human life. You're not safe today to walk on the streets. In fact, your life is not safe today. Now, I know that the officials would deny this, and believe me, they are very quick to deny it. But the reason your life is not safe in this land of ours today is because of the attitude toward capital punishment. When a criminal knows that if he takes a life, his life is going to be sacrificed, then may I say to you, he'll think twice before he takes a life. Then the idea today, we're trying to get a gun control law. May I say to you, the problem is not with the gun in the hand, it's the heart that's inside a man. That's where the problem is today. And therefore, you have to control man in this particular area to make it safe for you and for other human beings to walk our streets and to step out of their home at night. Why, we are finding many members of our church, that is, those that are single, women that are mature, that are single, they shut their door at night and they don't dare open up until the morning light. May I say to you, we better get the law back on the statute books, let me tell you, and get rid of this sob sister stuff. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for the image of God made he man. Now, this is the basis of human government. This is the area under which man and the Gentiles have moved. This has not been changed as far as governments of the world are concerned. Now, will you notice, and you... Be ye fruitful, and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And God continues on here. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you. That includes now the human race. Now he says, And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl of the earth, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. In other words, all of God's creatures are included in this. And there's a very interesting statement made by Isaiah about the lion and the lamb someday will lie down together and that they'll not hurt. And then Paul says the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain. May I say to you that God now has made this covenant for the protection of these until that day comes. For all of God's creatures, with every living creature that's with you, God says. Now will you notice, he says in verse 11, "...and I will establish my covenant with you, 
neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth." Now, here is God's promise, and His purpose is that He'll no longer destroy the earth with a flood. The next judgment on the earth is a judgment by fire. We find that in Second Peter, the third chapter. Now we come down here to verse 12, and you have here the picture of the covenant, and I think really a spiritual meaning of the covenant. It's a sort of a sacrament, if you please. Now, the thing that makes it that, the visible signs to which are next promises. And here you have it. Now let me read this particular section here, beginning at verse 12. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that's with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. It shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. The rainbow is more or less of a sacrament. That is, it's a token of a covenant. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, and the bow shall be in the cloud. Now, will you notice, God says, I will look upon it, and that I may remember. You see, God didn't say you'd see it. He said he'd see it. He didn't say you would look upon it. He would look upon it, if you please. And it would be an everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. That ought to be the encouragement when you look at a rainbow. Verse 17, And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth." Now, this is God's covenant, not just with Noah, but all flesh that is upon the earth. You see, what you have here is actually almost a sacrament. As we said, a sacrament is a visible sign to which are annexed certain promises. The Passover, they ate the Passover. The brazen serpent was put up, and there was Gideon's fleece, and there's baptism today and the Lord's Supper. Dr. Lang puts it like this, God's eye of grace and our eye of faith meet in the sacraments. And that's what happens here when man looks at the rainbow. Faith lays hold of the promise attached to the sign. You see, the merit is in what the sign speaks of. There's no faith in a promise, and there's no assurance in a sign. The word and the sign go together, you see. God makes a promise and attaches a sign to it. Now, the rainbow is God's answer to Noah's altar. God says, I'll remember and I'll look upon it. A friend of mine told me he was traveling by plane across the country, and they were going over a storm, and all of a sudden they saw a rainbow. And he says it was the first time in his life he'd ever seen a rainbow that went all the way around. Now, this is something that's very disappointing in the rest of this chapter. The question arises, well, when man came out after the flood and all the sinners are dead, then there's no more sin in the earth. Is that right? Well, let's look and see. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Now, why does he say that? Well, for two reasons we'll see in a moment. And the second is that they're going right now traveling to the land of Canaan. It's nice for them to know this. It'll be an encouragement. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman. He planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine, and he was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And my friend, may I say to you, here you have Noah's sin. And the hard fact of the matter is that Noah got drunk, and this is said. There's actually no satisfactory excuse. Many have been made. One is that he was ignorant of the effect of wine, since no one 
had been drunk before. And you'll notice back before the flood, drunkenness is not mentioned as one of the sins. Then there are those who hold the canopy theory about the flood. There are many things I did not mention. The canopy theory is that there was ice covering over, the sunlight filtered through, and that grapes would not ferment before. And this was something new for this man Noah. Well, all I can say is that it's a new beginning in a new world, but it's old sin that still lacks. And this reveals that. That's the reason this is given. That's the big question. Why did God give it? Well, he gave it for a very definite reason. Let me drop down and read verse 22. We are told that he was drunken, uncovered within his tent, and Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And then we're told Shem and Japheth covered him, and Noah woke from his wine, knew what his younger son had done unto him, And notice what he does. He said, Cursed be Canaan, not Ham. And I'd have you note that. And I'd like to answer. This is something that always comes up. Isn't the curse of Ham upon the dark races? That is not true. That is absolutely absurd. And the Scripture does not teach that to begin with. The coloration of the skin, the pigment that's in the epidermis, of the human family has come there not because of sin within, but because of sunlight on the outside. And he says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now, these people are going to the land of Canaan. That's the reason it's mentioned here. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Canaan shall be his servant, and God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. You must remember that the first two great civilizations were Hamitic civilizations, the Egyptian and the Babylonian. They were both that, if you please. Now, this is the great covenant God made then with Noah. We'll leave off right there today. Now, today, friends, we come back to the book of Genesis, and we are down to the tenth chapter But probably I should say a word or two before we leave the ninth chapter, because the question always comes up, why is this recorded about Noah and the sin of Noah? Well, may I say that if man had written the book, he would have done one of two things. He would have covered it up and made Noah a hero, or else he would have made it a great deal more sordid than it is. But the fact of the matter is that it's recorded for a purpose. It's recorded to let you and me know that God was encouraging the children of Israel in entering the land of Canaan for the very simple reason that there was a curse pronounced upon them, a judgment upon them. And all you have to do is read the rest of the Scripture, the Old Testament, on secular history to discover that. Canaanites have pretty much disappeared. And then these things, we're told, are written for our learning. It's to let you and me know something of the weakness of the flesh, that the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the Lord Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And Paul made it very clear that no flesh would be justified by keeping the law at all. And Paul in Galatians 2.16 says, For by the law shall no flesh be justified. So that what we have here is the story of a man that fell. And it's a story of the weakness of the flesh. Now, we offered an excuse for Noah last time, but frankly, this is the bare facts of getting right down to the nitty-gritty. Noah got drunk. And that raises for us today the real problem. It may be that you as a Christian do not get drunk. But may I say, maybe you and I are living in the flesh to the extent we're just as displeasing to God as Noah was. We today have, I think, a wrong conception of life and this universe that we are in. For instance, our nation has spent billions of dollars to put man on the moon. And it's just not a good place to live, it looks like. But nothing is spent 
on how to live on the earth. And you know that's what God is concerned about, is to train you and me how to live on the earth. And so you have this tremendous statement, and there's no curse pronounced upon Ham. The curse is upon Canaan, his son. And I do not know how much Canaan was involved in this. All we are given is just the record here, and we recognize that Canaan is mentioned for a very definite purpose. But it hasn't anything to do with a curse of color that's put upon any part of the human race. I think that has been one of the sad things that have been said about the black man that is not fair to him at all. And it's not fair to God, because he never said that. After all, the first great civilizations were Hamitic civilizations, the Egyptian and the Babylonian. And we need, I think, to make it very clear, certainly Noah didn't lose his salvation. I trust that you understand that, that it was an awful thing, and frankly, I see no excuse for it. Now, we come to chapter 10, and when we come to chapter 10, we are in this area here where we see the genealogies, actually the families, the origin of the nations of the world. Now, this chapter 10 is far more important than the attention I'm going to give to it today. Now, I regret that I can't give more attention to it, but we do have to cut corners in certain places. And very frankly, this is a chapter that will only interest certain folk who are interested in ethnology or anthropology and the story of man on the earth. And I have before me a chart made by a man with his master's degree who has majored in ethnology, H.S. Miller. And it's a very complicated chart. It shows where all of the races of the world, the different nations, came from. You can find out here where you came from. And you may be sure that the sons of Japheth never are part of the lost tribes of Israel. They just don't get that way. And ethnology would never bear out that type of thing. That makes this a very interesting chapter. And by the way, this man who got his masters in this field used the tenth chapter of being basic to any study that there is a threefold division of the human family today, three major divisions in ethnology, and revealed in these three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now we have given to us here in this 10th chapter the genealogies of all three of them. You have Japheth in verses 2 and 5. And then we have those that are given of Ham, verses 6 through 20. And they were the ones outstanding at the very beginning, by the way. And then you have the sons of Shem, verses 21 to 33. And you find that the same pattern that we've had so far is being followed, and it'll be followed right through the Bible for that matter. God gives the rejected line first and a word concerning it. Then he drops that subject, not to be brought up again, by the way. And then he gives the accepted line, the line that's leading to Christ. So you have here these threefold division of the human family. Let me read again. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and under them were sons born after the flood, the three sons of Noah, and now the sons of Japheth. We have Gomer, Magog, Madai, and all of that. Now, in this chart that I have before me, if you wanted to follow through in that, You'd find out that the Scythians, the Slavs, Russians, Bulgarians, Bohemians, Polish, Slovaks, Croatians, all came from Magog and then from Madai. The Indians came from there. And the Iranic races, Medes, Persians, Afghans, Kurds. And then from Javan, 
why we have the Greeks, Romans, and the Romance nations, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and so on. Then you have coming from Tyrus, the Thracians, the Teutons, the Germans, and from them you have the East Germanic and the European races, the North Germanic or the Scandinavians, and the West Germanic, and from them the High German, the Low German, the Angles and the Saxons and the Jews, the Anglo-Saxon race, the English people. May I say to you, this is a tremendously interesting chart, and I wish that it was possible for us to send it out, but we have no supervision over that chart at all, and I'd get in trouble if I attempted to send it out. But it is extremely interesting. And then you have the sons of Ham given here, and we begin in the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, and Foot, and Canaan. Now, you see, there were other sons of Ham, but the curse only went upon Canaan. Why it didn't go upon the others? I'm not prepared to say. I recognize there are others that can give you the whole thing. Now, from Cush, there came the Ethiopians. And may I say that actually from the Canaanites, you get the Phoenicians and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, the Gergesites, Hivites, and all the other electric lights too, by the way. But frankly, you find that the Africans came from Cush, and they're the Ethiopians. Mizraim, the Egyptians, and the Libyans, you see. So that all of these races, they were Hamitic, if you please. This is a tremendous division. And then we have the story here of Cush begat Nimrod. He became a mighty one in the earth. And mighty, actually, what this man wanted, he wanted to become if you please, the ruler of a great world empire. That's exactly what the man was interested in. He wanted to become a great world ruler. And we find that he attempted to do it. We are told here he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And he's not a wild game hunter. Sometimes they give a boy a little air gun, and he goes out and shoots a sparrow, and when he comes in, why, they say, my, look, he's a little Nimrod. He had a sparrow. But actually, Nimrod wasn't shooting sparrows or hunting wild game in Africa. He was a hunter of men's souls. That's the thought here. Wherefore it said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eric, and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar, those great cities that were there. He's the founder of them. Now, he has quite a story that you pick up in secular history. Hislop, in his book, The Two Babylons, gives the background, which I'm not going to enter into today at all, but it's a very fascinating story of how Nimrod actually is responsible, I think, for the Tower of Babel, for he attempted to bring together the human race after the flood in an effort to get them united in a race or in a nation where he could become a great world ruler. He was the founder of Babel. He's a rebel, hunter of the souls of man. He's the lawless one, and he's a shadow and a type of the last world ruler, Antichrist, who's to come. And this is a man that is before us here. I don't care to enter into more detail concerning him. The first great civilization came, therefore, out from the sons of Ham. We need to recognize that it's so easy today to fall into the old pattern. We were taught that in school, let's face it, a few years ago. Now, the black man today is wanting more study given of his rights. I don't blame him. I don't think probably he's been given an opportunity in the past couple hundred years. But if you want to know the story of the black man, the story of his beginning, he just happened to head up the two great civilizations, the first two that appeared on this earth. They were sons of Ham. And that's important to see. Nimrod was a son of Ham. And then we are told, as we go on down in this, 
And I'm not going to attempt to develop that line at all, but in verse 21 we are told, under Shem. Now we're given the line that's going to lead to Abraham and then to the nation Israel and to the coming of Christ into the world. This is the pattern of the Holy Spirit. He gives the rejected line first, he drops it, then he picks up the other. Now we're going to follow this line, which is a very important thing to note. And God is bidding goodbye to the rest of humanity for the time being, because he's coming back after them later on. Safer in his book, and I want to quote him now. This is one of the most remarkable statements concerning the 10th chapter of Genesis. Let me read it. The 10th chapter of Genesis is a very remarkable chapter. Before God leaves, as it were, the nations to themselves and begins to deal with Israel, his chosen people from Abraham downward, he takes a loving farewell of all the nations of the earth, as much as to say, I'm leaving you for a while, but I love you. I have created you. I've ordered all your future, and their different genealogies are traced. That is the picture we have before us. Now, in this chapter, 70 nations are listed, 14 of them from Japheth. Thirty of them came from Ham. Don't forget that. I'd give you a different conception today of the black man at his beginning. Now, I do want to say this, and I should add, I think, that 26 nations from Shem. So you have 70 nations that are listed here. It would seem to me that God has done this. Why has the white man in our day been so prominent? Well, I'll tell you why, because at the beginning it was the black man, the colored races. Then you have the sons of Shem. During the time of David, they made a tremendous impact upon this world. And you'll notice that from Shem there came others, actually the Syrians, not the Chaldeans, I disagree with that, but there came the Lydians, and not the Assyrians, but Syrians and the Armenians, and you find that from them came the Arabians from Joktan, and you find several of these great nations. Now, they appeared. Next. Now, we are in that period, apparently, where the white man has come to the front. I think that all three are demonstrating that regardless of whether it's a son of Ham, Shem, or Japheth, they are incapable of ruling this world. And that's what God is demonstrating, I believe. And to see this is a tremendous thing. Now you have in the sons of Shem one that is mentioned that a great deal is made of, and that's in verse 25, and I must mention it to pass on. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, when I went over this before, I received all sorts of weird interpretations of what it meant the earth was divided, and that it speaks actually that there is a physical division here in the earth, that the earth had some tremendous physical catastrophe that took place. Well, frankly, all in the world that Moses is saying here, friends, he's anticipating the next chapter in which he's going to give the Tower of Babel. That was the time the earth was divided. And may I say, the simple interpretation just seems to be the one that a great many miss, and we ought not to. Now I drop down to pick up the last verse, verse 32 of this chapter. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. And I want to submit to you that this is one of the great chapters of the Bible, and yet we spent less time with it than any other. But you can see what a rich study this would make for anyone who really wanted to take not a bias, but a fair appraisal of the human family. This has been a very remarkable chapter, and a great many have used it. Now we come to the 11th chapter, and we come here to what I sometimes have called the greatest tongue movement on record. 
and that was the Tower of Babel. Now, let's move down in this, because I won't get very far, but I will get a little ways. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, I do not know what language they spoke at that time. A friend of mine, a fellow Texan, a preacher in Texas, he told me, he said, you and I probably are the only two that really know what they spoke before the Tower of Babel, and that was Texan. Well, I'll be honest with you, since then I've come to the conclusion it could have been something else. But what the language was, I don't know. And I believe whatever that language was will be the language that will be spoken in heaven. I think it's going to be a much better language than we have today. They'll have better nouns and verbs and adverbs and adjectives. Now, will you notice, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. Now, apparently man was moving toward the west. That they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now, that is in the Tigris, Euphrates Valley. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. Well, down in that area there's no stone, and so they made brick. And that in and of itself reveals something about the building. It's not, shall I say, a sort of a phony building. Well, according to that, then, practically all the buildings in our cities today are that way, made of brick, and that's the type of building material, I guess, that's more popular than any other kind today. And yet, the brick was used there because of the practicality of it. It was a necessity. Now, notice what they did. And they said, Go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, you will notice that I have emphasized that business of us. They've got a bad case of perpendicular aetas. Let us make us a name. And this is to be a rallying place for man. I think the sole purpose of this was to be a rallying place for man. And I'm going to go into a great deal more detail next time. But the Tower of Babel was a ziggurat. And the many ruins of them in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. I have a picture of the ruins of the one in Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham lived. And it was made of brick, solid, and around it was a runway that went to the top. And apparently on top of it was an altar and which in certain instances they offered human sacrifice. Later on, the children were offered in a red-hot idol. All of this was connected with the ziggurat later on. But at this time, they make a tower, and it's to reach to heaven. Now, don't get the impression that they're trying to get their feet out of water. They're trying to build above flood stage. That's not even the thought at all. The whole thought is that they are attempting to build something that is a rallying point for man against God. That's what the Tower of Babel was. It was rebellion against Almighty God. Now, friends, last time I only got down through the third verse of the eleventh chapter of Genesis. And if you have your Bible, we'll pick up at the fourth verse. Now, I did read verse 4 last time. But I want to begin there today, and this is the Tower of Babel that men built. It was built, as we saw, of brick and slime, not of stone and mortar. To begin with, it wasn't down in that valley. And I read now verse 4, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. 
Now the emphasis here is upon us. Let us, let us, you notice, a bad case, as we said last time, of perpendicular aidas. But apparently it was Nimrod that led in this movement. He was the builder of Babel and evidently the tower of Babel. And it was to be a place for him to rear a world empire that is opposed to God. And in order to realize his ambition and make his dream come true, there are two factors and features that are essential. He needed a center of unity, a sort of headquarters, as it were, a capital, a place to assemble, a place to look to, as it were. And that was the city of Babel. And then there had to be a rallying point, not just geographical, but psychological, that which gives motive, a reason, a spark, an inspiration, sort of like rally around the flag, boys, or a song, or a battle cry. Remember the Maine, remember Pearl Harbor. There must be some impelling and compelling motivation. Must be a monument. Lenin's tomb is where communism meets. And in that day, it's the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel, let us make us, is defiance and rebellion against God. Let us make us a name, overweening ambition. Now, let's see what the Tower of Babel was not. It was not a place for man to go in time of high water. He wasn't building above the flood stage. That's a very trivial and, I think, puerile interpretation. After all, Lenin's tomb is not a place to go when the Volga River overflows. This tower revealed the arrogant, defiant, and rebellious attitude of man against God. God said to man, scatter over the earth and replenish the earth. Man said, nothing doing. We're not going to scatter. We're going to get together. We're through with you. And the Tower of Babel was against God. Now, it's not just a symbol. It's not non-religious. It was religious. It's a ziggurat. All through that valley, as we've indicated, the ruins remain today. As I told you, I have a picture of the ruins of the ziggurat that was at Ur of the Chaldees. And this was the place where they worshipped the creature rather than the creator. They worshipped the sun, moon, and stars. There was a runway on the outside of it. It was more or less solid. Some were round, some were square. But this runway led to the top, and on top they worshipped the sun, moon, and stars. After all, When you could see the sun, moon, and stars, you're not going to have a flood. And God had been pretty mean to send a flood, according to them. Now, will you notice God's reaction? And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they had imagined to do. Now, this is a tremendous statement. You see, language has been a tremendous barrier, and they are now going to attempt to build a tower and get together. They're all one language, and you find here fallen nature in spite of the flood. Man's totally depraved. And that question is now, God cannot ignore this rebellion, and this is rebellion against God. And so God's going to put up a protective wall. He's going to throw up a wall, and he has to do it for several reasons. One reason is man is a very capable creature. He can go to the moon. He can fly on a jet plane. I'm amazed the other day going to the Hawaiian Islands sitting five miles in the air in a jet plane, being served a delicious dinner. I just can't get over it myself. I'll be honest with you. seems unbelievable. Man's done that, friends. Man's a very competent creature. Now you can see what he would do with one language if they all came together against God. So God put up a barrier. And so notice what he did. 
He says in verse 7, "...go to, let us go down." Man said, let us. Well, God says, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it is called Babel, confusion, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now man is scattered over the face of the earth. And he's scattered now because here they are building the Tower of Babel. They can get together, and now they can't understand one another. You know, language barrier is a barrier and a wall that's higher than the wall of China. It's higher than the Berlin Wall, more effective. It is that which separates people, and it's stronger than any national border or any ocean. The language barrier, where there's no communication. Now, the question has always been raised, and in fact, a great many try to say, well, this took place gradually. Well, it says that God confounded their language, so right there as they were building, they couldn't understand each other, and they went in every direction. Now you have here this tremendous thing that takes place. Here's a speaking in tongues, and they couldn't understand each other. Also, it's a miracle of hearing as well as speaking, because you have a miracle of tongues or ears here. They spoke a different language, and the ear couldn't hear what the other one was saying. Now, frankly, this is something that God did, and the question arises, and I'd like to ask you the question, was this a blessing in disguise, or was it a curse upon man? Well, for God's purposes, it was a blessing. For man's development away from God, it was definitely a judgment. And it's been a great hindrance, as you well know, down through the centuries. Man has been kept separate. And one of the things that's happening today through this matter of radio and TV and the jet plane is the walls are being broken down. And the walls of Jericho are certainly come tumbling down today. And that is the reason that I believe that God's coming down again in judgment is because of that. But I'd like to put over against this tongues movement the day of Pentecost. That was another great tongues movement. And at that time, why we find the gospel is given in all the languages that were understood that. It wasn't given in an unknown tongue. That never was the tongues movement to begin with. And you find on the day of Pentecost, God's giving his answer to the Tower of Babel. God is saying to mankind now, I have a gospel and a message for you, and I'm coming to you with the gospel in your language. And that is the thing that God has done. And today the Bible has probably gone into more languages. Well, not probably, it has, than any other book. It's gone into more languages than any other book. And today it's being translated and the gospel is being brought to literally hundreds of tribes throughout the world today. You see, the gospel is for all mankind. And the reason and the purpose for the talking in tongues is to let the human race know that God had answered the Tower of Babel, and he had a redemption for man now. The mission has been accomplished. No longer necessary today for man to try to work out his salvation. He is now to turn to God and listen to God's message. And the gospel, therefore, is for you, whoever you are today. And whatever tongue you speak, it's for you. It's for the nations of the world. And we're told that finally in the book of Revelation, they gathered there in his presence out of all the tribes of the earth. Now, that brings us to the end of the Tower of Babel, and frankly, I think that's about as far as we care to go with that. There are many other things that 
we'd like to see. Now you'll notice that we're going to take up the line of Shem, because it's the line of Shem that we're going to follow. Verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old. And then when you follow down through this, why, you have his genealogy given, and you come way down to verse 24, and we read, And Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah a hundred and nineteen years, and he begat sons and daughters. But you see, we're following Terah. Why Terah? Well, verse 26, And Terah lived seventy years and begat Abram. Nahor and Haran. Now, we're going to follow Abram's line. You see, we're following the line of Shem, and we're going actually right through the Bible following this line. In other words, the Word of God is going to begin now and go directly to the cross of Christ. That's exactly. God has put down all of this as preliminary. And you see that God now has demonstrated to man that he's in sin. There at Cain and Abel, we find that Cain would not acknowledge that he was a sinner. You have pride of life there. And then at the flood, you see the sin of the flesh. They were given over to the sins of the flesh. They were indulging in violence, and every thought and imagination was evil. And they were blind to the need of the person of Christ. They were deaf to his claim, dead to God, dead in trespasses and sins. And God gave an invitation through Noah. Those are the sins of the flesh at the flood. And then here at the Tower of Babel, it's the sin of the will. May I say it's rebellion against God. This is the Tower of Babel. And do you have a Tower of Babel? your own little tower of Babel that you built away from God, and are you in rebellion against him? Well, it's natural for human nature to be in rebellion against God. A little boy, he was really very cantankerous one evening. It was a rainy evening, and he was really cutting up. And his mother was having a great deal of trouble with him. And finally, she just had to get her little boy, little Willie, and she put him in the corner and sat him down with his face to the corner and told him to sit there. And she left him in the room, and she went out into the living room with the rest of the family. And after a while, why, she heard a noise in there, and she said to him, Willie, are you standing up? And he says, No, Mom, I'm sitting down, but I'm standing up on the inside of me. Well, believe me, friends. There are a lot of men today and women standing up on the inside of them against God, their own little tower of Babel. Now we are following this line that's going to lead to Christ. Verse 27, these are the generations of Terah. You see, we're following the families. These are the families of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father, Tyr, in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah. The name of Nahor's wife, Melchah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Melchah and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. Haran means delay. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Now that is given to us to let us know that we're going to follow Abraham. And his story will begin now in the next chapter. And that will tell to us the story now and the book of Genesis, and for that matter, the Bible now, takes a turn. Now, you'll recall at the very beginning we said that there is a great 
Grand Canyon that goes right down through the book of Genesis. The first 11 chapters are on one side, and then from Genesis 12 all the way through the 50th chapter is on the other side. In these first 11 chapters, we cover 2,000 years plus as much as the rest of the Bible put together. And it's put over against just 350 years from Genesis 12 to Genesis 50. Now you have in these first 11 chapters creation, Genesis 1 and 2, and the fall in Genesis 3 and 4, the flood in Genesis 5 and 9, the Tower of Babel, Genesis 10 and 11. And we have seen these four great events, and this has covered a great deal of territory, and it's the reason we've spent so much time here. Now, at chapter 12, we go to the other side of the Grand Canyon. The atmosphere is altogether different now because we are going to slow down to a walk, just as we are in this five-year program. But not only that, the emphasis is from events, stupendous events, to great personalities, or, shall I say, important personalities, because some of them can't quite be called great. We have four here in Genesis, and of course there'll be more to follow in the other books of the Bible. Abraham is the man of faith, Genesis 12 through 23. Then we're going to have after that Isaac, the beloved son, and then Jacob, the chosen and chastened son, and then Joseph, suffering and glory, the one who's more like Christ in his life and the events of his life than any man who ever lived. And yet he's never mentioned as a type of Christ anywhere in the Bible. Now, I just want to introduce us here to chapter 12 today. That'll be coming up next time. We have here in chapter 12, and we probably ought to say this, we're halfway through the Bible, friends, chronologically. And the five-year program just getting underway. And we're halfway between creation and the cross. And now God has turned from the nations to a man through whom God will make a nation, and in turn from that nation will bring the Savior of the world. Now, Abraham, by any person's measuring rod, though, is a great man. He's one of the greatest men who's ever lived on this earth. And how do you measure great men even today? Well, to begin with, a man has to be famous. And Abraham certainly measures up to that. I think that he's probably the world's most famous man. Did you know that probably more people have heard of Abraham than have heard of anyone else, than the President of the United States or any movie star? or any athlete, more have heard of Abraham. May I add to that, that the three great religions of the world go back to Abraham, and I'm having to put Christianity in that now. We have, first of all, Judaism, and then we have Islam, and then we have Christianity. They all go back to Abraham. Abraham is very important. Literally, there are millions of people in Asia and Africa today that have heard of Abraham. But they never heard of the ones that make the headlines in our country today. That's one of the marks of a great man. Abraham was a great man. What is another mark of a great man? Well, he must be a generous man, a noble character. Well, can you imagine anyone that's more generous than Abraham? I doubt whether the man living today would have done what he did. When he and his nephew came back into that land, he told Lot to choose any portion he wanted, and he'd take what was left. You think any man would do that today in a business deal? I don't think so. They don't even do it in the church today, friends, let alone in a hard-boiled business world today. But Abraham was a generous man. And have you ever noticed how generous he was with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah? He told them, I won't take the booty. I won't even take a shoestring from you or a piece of thread. God is the one he was looking to. And then a third thing, a great man must live in a momentous time. He must be, as Napoleon said, a man of destiny. 
the man and the right time must meet at the crossroads of life. That was certainly true of Abraham. And then the fourth thing, I believe the world would agree with me up through the first three I've mentioned, but maybe not on this one. He must be a man of faith. And you'll notice that all great men, even when they're not Christian, have something that they believe in. Now, Abraham has been called a Columbus of faith. I doubt whether that's true. But we are going to see he had seven great visions and four backslidings, and each time brought him closer to God. And it's said of Abraham, the greatest thing that's said about him in the Bible is that he believed God. Abraham believed God, was counted to him for righteousness. I mention all of this so that you will know next time when we take up Abraham in the 12th chapter, we are taking up one of the great men of all time and the great man of either secular or sacred history. No one quite measures up to him who is just altogether human. And we'll be looking at him next time and spending some time talking about the man that's probably mentioned more than any other in the Word of God. Friends, if you have your Bible, you'll want to turn with us today to the twelfth chapter of the book of Genesis. We are now getting well on in our Through the Bible program. And as we said last time, we're halfway through the Bible chronologically, but that is not actually true, of course. We finished eleven chapters of the book of Genesis, and we are moving slowly this time because we're going to be at this five years, the Lord willing. We trust that you have notes and outlines to follow along with. If you do not have them, write in and ask for yours. Now, for those of you that believe in the program and want to support it, we will send to you, if you request it, our book, Going Through Genesis. It will give you not just an outline of the book of Genesis, but an outline of each chapter of Genesis. And that's very important. Now we have concluded here the first 11 chapters, and it might be well, since this is a tremendous break here, just to have a brief review. In these first 11 chapters, we have seen four great events, creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. These are tremendous events, and it's in this section that we've seen that God has been dealing, actually, with the entire race of mankind, not so much individuals, but actually with the race of mankind. All the way from Adam to Abraham, God had not appeared to anyone, only to Adam and to Abraham. And God is dealing with the human race at this time, the entire universe. Now there's a radical change here at chapter 12, and through the rest of the book of Genesis, we have something quite remarkable. And that is, now we have brought before us four individuals. Now it's no longer events, but God now is dealing with a man, and from that man he'll make a nation. And we have in this first section, Abraham, the man of faith, Genesis 12 through 23. Then we have Isaac, the beloved son, Genesis 24 to 26. And then Jacob, the chosen and chastened son, Genesis 27 through 36. And then Joseph, suffering and glory, Genesis 37 through 50. And these are the four patriarchs that are so important to the understanding of the Word of God. And we're taking up their story now in the rest of the book of Genesis. You see, God now has demonstrated, and I trust that he has to your satisfaction, that he can no longer deal with the race. Because after the fall of man, you have the great sin of Cain, and what was his great said? Pride. I tell you, he was angry because of the fact down deep in his heart. He was proud of the offering that he brought, and it was rejected, caused him to hate his brother. 
You see, that leads to envy, and pride was the sin of the devil. It is the sin of the mind. And then at the flood, that was the lust of the flesh. We saw that the things, even the imagination of man and his actions, everything was to satisfy the flesh. And then we saw the Tower of Babel, and that was open rebellion against God. Now, God had to bring the flood to judge man. If God had waited even another generation, and he'd been patient 120 years, and from the day of Methuselah, 969 years, God had been patient with the world, and they hadn't turned to him. And I'm confident that any person will say that 969 years is long enough to give anybody an opportunity to change their mind. And they didn't change their mind. They are now in open rebellion, asserting a will that is against God, none seeking after God. And the Tower of Babel reveals that. Now God is going to have to do something differently. He turns from the race of mankind. And now he takes an individual, and from that individual, he's going to bring a nation, and out of that nation, He'll bring a Redeemer, and to that nation he'll give his revelation. Actually, this is the only way, apparently, that God could do it. Or let's put it like this. If there were other ways, this is the best way, because we can trust God to do the thing that is the best thing to do. Now, when God called Abraham, you're going to find out he's the man of faith. We said last time, we attempted to point out that Abraham was one of the great men that's been on this earth. And we were using, by the way, the secular measuring rod for that. And I believe that today the world would accept that he was the world's most famous man. More people heard of Abraham than anybody that's ever lived. Three great world religions came from him. There are men out yonder in that desert today that never heard of the President of the United States. They never heard of who won the golf tournament. They do not know who is the football hero. Never heard of them. They've heard of Abraham. And the interesting thing is the heroes of today will be forgotten tomorrow. For 4,000 years now, Abraham has made the headlines. He's a pretty famous man, friends. And then... If you want the measurement of the world, he was a generous man. He was a wealthy man, tremendously wealthy. He was the John D. Rockefeller and the Henry Ford and the Paul Getty and anyone else that you want to put in the list and sheets of one of these rich oil countries in the Middle East all rolled into one. By the standard of his day, he was a very wealthy man. But he was a man of faith, and I recognize that the world somehow or another doesn't feel like that that is the way that you measure an individual. Well, that's the way God measured him. God said he's a man of faith. And we'll find as we go through here that that is the thing that's developed in his life. Seven times God appeared to this man, and each time to develop faith in his life. He was not perfect at first. The fact of the matter is, he fell on his face. God gave him four tests, and he fell on his face on all four of them, friends. But like Simon Peter, he got up and brushed himself off and started again. May I say to you, if God has touched your heart and life, you may fall, but you're sure going to get up and start over again. Now, we're going to see that as we get into this very rich chapter here. And this is very important, by the way. And we have here in chapter 12 the call of Abraham. And we'll be following this all the way through the Word of God. Now let me read here these first three verses because they are very important verses, if you please. Now, will you note, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now, that's number one. 
of the things God promised to Abraham. He promised him three things, and this is the hub of the Bible. May I say all of it rests upon this threefold promise. And the Bible is just an unfolding, actually, of this threefold promise. God says, a land I'm going to show you, and I'm going to give it to you. The second thing God said he's going to do, verse 2 now, chapter 12 of Genesis. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Well, God said he'd make his name great. God's done pretty well there. And God said, here the third thing, I'll make you a blessing. God says, I'll make you a great nation, and I'm going to make you a blessing to all mankind. God brought from them a great nation, and it has probably the longest tenure as a nation of any people on this earth today. No one can quite match them. And then the third thing, he said to them, you're going to be a blessing. Well, through Jesus Christ, they've been a blessing to the world. The giving of the Word of God, they've been a blessing. God's made good except that first one. He said, I'm going to give you that land. And you look what's happening over there today. They've just got their toenails in the land, and they're holding on by their toenails. But they don't have it. Somebody says, well, God didn't make that good. Let's don't put it like that, friend. Why don't you be friendly toward the Bible and give God a chance? Some people don't even give him a chance. Now, look at it like this. Four thousand years ago, God said to Abraham, three things I'm going to do for you. Now, two-thirds of them have been made good right to the very letter. And because of disobedience, God said he wouldn't let them be in the land if they were disobedient and if they're away from him. And they are away from him today, by the way. And as a result, why, they're having trouble over there. Don't say God's not making good. The fact of the matter is God's doing exactly what he said he'd do. Now, the day will come when God will put them back in the land. When he does, it won't be a toehold. They're really going to have it all the way to the Euphrates. They'll be up as far as the Hittite nation was and all the way down the river of Egypt, which is a little river in that Arabian desert, so that what we have here is a land they've never really occupied at the very zenith of their power. They occupied 30,000 square miles. But that's not what God gave them. He gave them 300,000 square miles. They've got a long ways to go, but they'll have to take it on God's terms in God's appointed time. And the United Nations can't do anything about it, and the United States and Russia won't be able to settle the problem. You know, it's very comfortable today where I sit. I've come to the position that God's running things, friends, and it's just nice to sit here and not be scared by the headlines in the paper and not to be disturbed by what's going on in the world. He's in control, and he's going to work it out his way. Now, God promised these three things to Abraham. What did Abram do? So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Uh Uh-oh, already he's disobeying. May I say to you, he took relatives with him. He should not have done that. And he took his papa with him, Papa Terah. And God told him not to take them. Now, why did God want to get him out of the land away from his relatives? Well, it's quite obvious. When you go over to the book of Joshua, and I'll not turn to it today, but God said to Joshua, I called your fathers, Abraham, on the other side of the flood when they were serving other gods. Old Abram was an idolater. You see, the world was pretty far gone at this time. God had to move like this if he's going to save humanity. Now, the other alternative is he could have blotted them all out and started over again. I'm glad he didn't. If he hadn't, I wouldn't have been here because I arrived here a sinner. And the fact of the matter is sinners would have been blotted out. But thank God he's a God of mercy and grace, and he saves sinners. Now, what we have here is this man taking along his nephew, and he took his father along. And what happened? 
Well, Abram took Sarah, his wife, that was all right, of course, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they'd gathered, and the souls that they'd gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, we find this man spent in Haran a nice period of time, patting his foot, marking time, and delayed the blessing of God. God never appeared to him until he moved into the land, until he got separated from at least the closer relatives, and he only brought Lot with him. Now, will you notice, we have to come back and say this again in verse 6. He says at the end of verse 5, "...and into the land of Canaan they came." Now, verse 6, "...and Abram passed through the land under the place of Sychem, under the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land." Here is the fact the Canaanite was then in the land. Now, may I add this right at this point, because it's very important. You know, a great many people are going to say, well, this was the land of corn and wine, the land of milk and honey. Everything was lovely. Abraham left a terrible place. Ur of the Chaldees, and he came to a wonderful place. Don't you believe a word of it? That's not what the Bible says. This man, Abram, left a place we know today through archaeology had a high civilization. I think maybe he might have had a bath in the house. He had a very wonderful civilization. He left that, and he came into the land of Canaan, and the Canaanite was still in the land. Now, the Canaanite was not civilized. He was a barbarian and a heathen, if there ever was one. And Abraham did not better his lot by coming into this land. That's not the point. The point is, will he obey God? Now he has obeyed God. And what happens? Verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And you just have to pay attention to that. Abram built an altar unto the Lord, <laughs> and God appears to him second time. While he was in the land of Haran, place of delay, God did not appear. You see, one of the reasons today many of us are not blessed in reading the Bible is because the Bible condemns us because we're not living up to the light we have. If we would obey God, then more blessing would come. God does not appear. Abram until Abram's ready to move out and obey God on the light he's had. Now God's ready to appear to him. He builds an altar. And Abram is a real altar builder, by the way, everywhere he goes. Notice verse 8. He removed from thence into a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Two things that he did now, he got into the land. He pitched his tent. He bought him a house in the new subdivision, and he moved in. He's going to retire in California, only it's going to be in the land of Canaan. He's arrived. He pitched his tent. That's what he lived in. Then he built it an altar. That's his testimony to God. And everywhere Abraham went, he left a testimony to God. What kind of testimony do you have? You don't have to put a track out in front of your house. And you don't have to write on the back end of your car, Jesus saves, and then drive like a maniac down the freeway. And there's some that do that. My friend, that's no testimony at all. May I say to you, this man quietly worshiped God. And the Canaanites soon caught on to that, by the way. And Abram, we're told, journeyed, going on still toward the south. That's a good direction to go. It's warm there, you see, good weather. And so this man is moving south. He has itchy feet. He's a nomad. That was Abram. Now we come to that blot in his life, the second one, I should say. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, 
that they shall say, This is his wife, and they'll kill me, but they will save thee alive. Now, Abram was in the land. It was a place of blessing. God never told him to leave, but a famine was in the land. And I think one morning Abram pushed back the flap of his tent, looked out and said, Sarah, it looks like everybody's going to Egypt. There's a famine, you know, and it's getting worse. Maybe we ought to think about going down. And I think Sarah said, well, anything you want to do, Abram, I'm your wife, I'll go with you. And so a few days went by, and Abram talked to some of these travelers, and one of them that had come from up north of where he lived, he says, it's getting worse, and it's coming south. And Abram said to Sarah that evening, I think maybe we better pack up and go to Egypt. Now, God never told him to. When God appeared to him last time, he says, This is it, Abram. This is the land I'm going to give you, and you'll be a blessing, and I'm going to bless you here. But you see, he didn't believe God. He went on down into the land of Egypt. And Egypt is a picture of the world in Scripture. You'll find that all the way through. I think it's still a picture of the world. It's my opinion of it, and I was there. And frankly, Abram went down there. It's amazing how the world draws Christians today. And so many of them rationalize today. And they say, well, now you know, Brother McGee, we're not able to come to church on Sunday night because we have to get up and go to work Monday morning. Well, believe me, everybody has to do that. And it's amazing that during the week on Thursday night, or Friday night, or Tuesday night, if there's a banquet, and they have a long-winded program, a lot of music, and a lot of talk, that part it doesn't seem to worry about getting up and going to work. It's amazing how the world draws Christians today, and they can rationalize. And I think if you'd met Abram going down to Egypt and said, wait a minute, Abram, you're going the wrong direction, the wrong way on a one-way street. You shouldn't be going this way. You should be staying in the land. He could have given you a good reason. Well, look, my sheep are getting pretty thin, and there's not any pasture for them. The grazing land is not very much, and there's plenty down in Egypt. We're going down there. And so they went down there. But immediately there was a problem. We have here something that's quite interesting. He's going to have trouble actually with his wife. And the reason is, she's beautiful. And next time, I want to tell you about what one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, at first, the unbelieving scholar thought that he had found something that was going to disprove the Bible. And have you noticed how silent that the higher critics have become? They just don't seem to have found any contradiction in the Bible. I want to give you next time how one of them confirms the Bible. It's quite interesting. And they thought it was something else when they found it. And that reveals the fact you better not listen to the scholars until all the facts are in. Well, we'll save that until next time. And in the meantime, why, we'll be going on down to Egypt with Abram because we want to go down and see what happened to him there. Now, if you have your Bible, turn with us to the twelfth chapter of the book of Genesis. And we're putting in today at verse 13. We're looking at Abraham, and he'll be a subject all the way through the Bible, by the way, and more said about Abraham probably than any other in the Scripture. Now, we found that Abraham went into the land after he dilly-dallied in the land of Haran, and God appeared to him when he got into the land. But he didn't stay there, although he went up and down the land, saw that it was a good land. And it's not like it is today, friends. I'd have you know that because a great many people can't understand how it could be called a land of milk and honey. We'll see that when we get to Deuteronomy, what happened to the land. But it was a glorious land in that day. But a famine came. And this man, Abraham, goes down to Egypt. And he recognized he'd get in difficulty because of the beauty of his wife. And we read here in verse 12, Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. 
but they'll save thee alive. Say, I pray thee that thou art my sister. And by the way, that was a half a lie. A half a lie sometimes is worse than a whole lie, and this time it certainly was to deceive. And Abram said to his wife, Sarah, Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Now, they have found, as many of you know, what are known as the Dead Sea Scrolls over in Qumran, along by the Dead Sea in caves there. And one set they got, they couldn't unroll it because it was so fragile and had been wrapped so long, the leather, they afraid it would just shatter and come to pieces. They could see one name, Lamech. So they called it part of the book of Lamech and said this was one of the apocryphal books of the Bible. Boy, were they wrong. The nation Israel bought it, and in the museum there, they began to moisten it and soften it, and they were able to unroll it. And what they found out was that it was the 12th chapter, 13th chapter, 14th chapter, 15th chapter of the book of Genesis, of all things, but not the text that we have, rather an interpretation of it. And here in chapter 12, in that part of it, why, it tells about the beauty of Sarah, actually describing her features and telling about how beautiful she was. Well, I think that merely confirms what the Word of God said. Pharaoh certainly wanted her. And then when you get to chapter 13, God told Abram, walk through the land and the length and the breadth thereof. And this scroll gives a first-person account by Abraham of his journey. And the very interesting thing is that that's not Scripture, but it merely confirms Scripture. And it also confirms the fact that that land was just like God said it was. The eyewitness, apparently back in those days, was able to discover it. And whether Abram ever gave a first-hand description, I don't know. But the Word of God doesn't say that. God says it. And that ought to be enough for us. And God puts it on that kind of basis. Now you remember the encounter that he had down in the land of Egypt. The thing was that Pharaoh did take Sarah. And as you well know, in that day, they'd have to go through a period of preparation for a woman to become the wife of a ruler. You find that in the book of Esther. And during that period, God appeared to Pharaoh and said, Don't you take that woman. That's another man's wife. And in verse 18 of the 12th chapter, Pharaoh called Abram and said, What's this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she's my sister? So I might have taken her to be my wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her, go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. They sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So God is overruling. But God does not appear to him in the land of Egypt. Now in chapter 13, we see the return of Abram from the land down there. And what we have here is Abram and Lot leave Egypt and return to the land of promise. And Lot here separates from Abraham and goes to Sodom. And what happens? Well, God appears to Abraham for the third time. Long as he's in the land of Egypt, and long as he's still holding on to Lot, God does not appear to him. The minute that he comes back to the land and there's a separation from Lot, God appears to him. 